Well, welcome to a new Harry's Farm video and um, you join me in the field where last time you saw me I had waders on and this was a point I couldn't actually stand. These are the flood buns, flood defences for the village and we're just 12 days. That was the 17th of November I was there. Today is the 29th of November and look what a difference 12 days make. Um, I can now actually stand here. I've gone back to a normal field. There's a little brook coming down across the field and this is what it's normally like. Um, those sort of flash floods have gone. We've had plenty of rain since, but we're promised some better weather next week, which I really hope arrives. But what I'm gonna do on this video is, I uh, promised to show you the sheep last time and didn't. So I'm gonna look at the sheep. We're gonna have a look what's happening on the arable bits of farm. But earlier this week, the BBC put out a program titled, Meet a Threat to Our Planet? Question mark. And this program has caused an absolute storm within the UK farming uh, community because it was a, well, a pretty biased look at meat production around the globe. And it particularly highlighted uh, how meat is produced in the USA and in South America, which is nothing like the UK uh, meat production, which is mainly grass fed. And I have to say what it highlighted in the US and South America, the clearing of the Amazon rainforests and um, beef production down in Brazil, is abhorrent to the UK farmer as it probably was to many UK consumers. It's not how we want to see meat production happening, but it was the way the programme intimated that the UK was just as guilty as what was happening over there on these giant feedlots, etc., when nothing could be further from the truth. Here in the UK, well, livestock production is generally done on the grassland that this country is blessed with and it represents around 66% of the farmed area in the UK and I think what needs to be spelt out and I did it on that original video this grassland that's all it does there is not an alternative use for this grassland it's steep you think of the moorlands the uh, Lake District Ireland the rainfall in Scotland those areas that can't be cropped we farm with grass um, and it's traditional, it's been going on centuries and cattle have been running over these um, uh, lowlands and highlands, well, like sheep and the highlands. That's how we farm in the UK and it's highly sustainable, leads tiny amount of inputs and we're turning basically grass into a very useful um, food product via livestock. And it isn't this threat to the um, planet and if you look at the livestock numbers, I checked back to see where we were, uh, livestock numbers, and we were um, uh, with 7 million um, cattle in the UK at the turn of the century. Um, that climbed to 15.4 million cattle in the 70s. Um, it was a big um, explosion in dairy and beef production um, was just higher then. With everything that's going on in the world, our population has um, increased but the actual livestock numbers in the UK are now down to around 9 million cattle. Big drop from where we were in the 70s and we're actually at a level where we were in the 1930s with cattle in this country. And, and what's happened is the population in the UK, if I compare it to the 30s, has gone from 40 million to 69 million. So you'd expect the cattle numbers to go up but the price isn't supported at retail and people just can't make money from beef. We're doing it because we, we like cattle, we've got this grassland, what else do we do with it? Well, we run cattle over it, it's a tradition. And it's not a problem um, for the planet. This isn't a suddenly causing global warming. Where, where I think there's a lot of mix up is when they measure the output of a cow, you'll see it's methane and it's all this deadly thing for CO2. Well, they actually measure it in a lab without taking any notice of the grassland. Because if you look back at that program, they're in feeding lots, they're feeding them soil. It do, those cattle never see grass. But unlike the UK uh, livestock population that are grazing these sort of fields like this. And a hectare of this grassland here sequences about four to six tonnes of carbon a year. Now that's about the same as you driving your car around a year is about 
four tonnes of CO2 produced. So every hectare of this grassland is absorbing that CO2 by naturally by photosynthesis. And then you get the cattle graze in it, and that actually encourages the grass growth. If you leave grassland, all it wants to do is produce a seed head. Once it's done a seed head, it gives up and sort of dies back. If you graze grassland, just like when you're mowing your lawn, you'll notice that you actually have to it produces more grass because all it wants to do is put a seed head up. So actually grazing produces more, more bulk of grass, which actually absorbs more CO2. So this is an organic um, grassland all through here. So there's no inputs whatsoever. There's probably been cattle grazing down here, as I mentioned previously, for centuries. Um, this is just what we do down here. And I wish, the, uh, my hope will come from this programme that it's highlighted this issue with some of the cattle production around the world, is the UK consumer will wise up and ask for grass-fed beef um, when they go shopping or, you know, supermarket or whatever. At the moment, beef is just beef. It's either organic beef or it's, um, it's sometimes the actual breed you buy Aberdeen Angus. Grass-fed is what we want to highlight. That's where sustainable cattle meat production is going to be, I think, in the future. And there's, there's some places that are really doing it very well. If you look up on the web, there's Piper's Farm down in Sussex, or there's Ludlow Farm up in Shropshire. They've got booming businesses supplying grass-fed beef and all sorts of other produce from their farm shops. And I think it's probably the way forward. I hope it is for the more informed consumer that perhaps is being you know properly scared by that BBC programme that was so unbalanced towards the UK livestock production. So there, there you go. There's a little background on that soapbox over, but I did think it needed to be said. Now let's go and have a look at the sheep on the farm. Okay, the, well the sheep are in um, all being split up uh, with individual rams. Basically, you just try out a ram. Um, if you've got a number of rams, you just want to see which is the best ram, which one produces um, the best stock. And the way of doing it is to as is happening here um, there's only a few young ewes here these are cambridge um, the, the breed cambridge ewes um, and they're renowned for having a really good uh, number of reared lambs sold so you're hoping for twins normally with um, sheep so to get anywhere near two lambs produced sold is amazing um, averaged about 1.7 these guys, I think last year they sold 2.2 lambs per ewe sold, reared, which is amazing. Um, the ram is there, he's got a slightly bent ear, I think he's a Texel, I, haven't, I should have asked. And you'll see he has a rattle marker. Now, when he goes to work on these ewes, he'll mount them and that wax marker on his chest will put a green splodge on the back of the ewe. And that's when you know, oh, it's been mated and it should hopefully be pregnant. And you also can tell which ram it is because they all have different colours. And uh, then when you, when you get the produce, you can see which is your best ram. Um, it's all fairly basic, but then I suppose it is um, sheep farming. But that's him. So he's, he's in here. They'll be down here for a few weeks. They've been here a couple of weeks and they'll probably be here until the end of December. And the gestation period for sheep, if I remember my college notes correctly, is four months, four weeks, four days. So just over five months they'll be producing, which puts us into sort of May, April, May lambing period. So an easy lambing, that's when the grass is coming up and that's why you do it around now. So there you go, that's a sheep and they're dotted around the farm. There's, I don't know, there's four or five lots of sheep all dotted around um, out of visual so they can just get on with their work and uh, they'll be here for a say for a few more weeks. So this is the uh, winter linseed we're in now and um, it's coming along really well really pleased with this um, it's growing up you can see the rows it looks reasonably healthy it got a bit hit by um, a bit of early frost and also the herbicide we put on to, uh, for the grass weeds that's all working now so now it looks like yeah, a reasonable crop of uh, linseed, exactly what I want it to look like. You can see the rows is always very pleasing. So we won't go anywhere near this field now until sometime in the spring it will get its first fertiliser application, probably in April time. Here's this wheat that we planted. It was that one day of drilling wheat, 31st of October. 29th of November, it's finally coming through the ground. It just shows you the difference sort of low soil temperatures make and all that wet weather. But the wheat is finally coming through the ground. I can just about see rows here and we managed on a um, driest day of uh, 
a couple of weeks ago, we got the pre-emergent spray on and some slug pellets. And I'm very glad I got the slug pellets on because I've had a look around and I can find the odd dead slug in here. So they're just nibbling, but hopefully that one dressing of slug pellets will remove the risk and it will get going with a warmer week forecast next week. Um, the stuff, the first weeks over at the other farm where we rolled, that looks great, all up in rows, and I'm a happy farmer when I look at that. So there you go, there's a quick roundup of what's happening on Harry's farm um, at the moment. Um, hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, well, I'll be doing more videos in a couple of weeks' time, so I'll see you then.